morning everyone good morning morning chair morning colleagues good morning welcome dr khurnabat welcome i'm trying to check the colleagues to come to the meeting so far i've got three four colleagues now plus myself let me look at the apologies The apologies that I'm having is for Honorable Brink, who's going to join us at 12. Honorable Mandiko Simabika is still on sick leave. The minister is attending a one Saturday meeting. And the deputy minister as well is... Recording in progress. It's attending... To, uh, some departmental commitments. And then uh, Dr. Dao is here, the head of the Disaster Management Center, will be able to deal with all these matters. And then we have Mr. Michael Prince, advocate, advocate Mr. Michael Prince with the parliamentary legal advisor. Also to, to welcome you, uh, Dr. Kornevald. We know this bill is being brought to us by your good selves. I should say upfront that the speaker has referred this draft disaster management amendment bill to this committee. Colleagues, you will read ATC of 10 February 2021. As I've indicated, this is a private member's bill sponsored by the Honorable Dr. P.J. Hurnevald from the FF Plus. Uh, then this is the bill that we want to deal with today. And then Dr. Hurnevald will provide more details in his presentation. Mm. The speaker has referred this bill to this committee in terms of the National Assembly Rule 276 as to assist the committee in planning its work and to enable the committee members to acquaint themselves with and develop uh, their position with regard to the proposed legislation. Uh, then I will then request uh, Mr. Prince, the parliamentary, legal advisor first before I hand over to you, uh, Honorable uh, Hornovald, so that uh, maybe uh, he can then, for the benefit of the other members, because also some of us, it's our first time that we deal with the private members bill, for him to then uh, guide us through the process, what needs to happen, so that we are all at the bar. Uh, are you ready, Mr. Prince? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members and guests. Um, yes, Chair, I'm ready to proceed. Yes. Um, am, am I audible enough? Yes, you are. You are. You are. Chair, with your permission. Proceed. Um, Regarding the process of the private members bill, I'd like to refer the committee members to rule, NA rule 286, which is headed process in the committee. Specifically rule, um, sub rule three is where they would start with the private members bill. Um, and I think that's the process that you're embarking on now. The rule um, requires that the committee must give the member adequate notice um, to brief the committee on his or her private members bill which is what the committee is doing now. Um, then I'd skip to in a rule 4E. Um, in a rule what? Sorry, 286 4E. So I'm, I'm in rule 286. 
Um, so, um, yes. ma'am. So four subsection e, four. Yeah. E. Subsection four, e. paragraph e. It's another requirement for the committee, which says that um, in this case, if the bill was introduced by a member, um, the committee must give the relevant department in the national executive. Um, or an organ of state in the national sphere of government sufficient opportunity to make submissions to the committee on the objects and particulars of the bill. So you would like, you would want, you would have to um, get inputs from the department or an organ of state that this proposed bill might um, affect. Chair, the committee will then have to discuss those inputs. The member, when the member briefs the committee, must also inform the committee whether um, when the member published the bill or the explanatory memorandum um, attached to the bill, whether the member received any um, public inputs, and that must also be presented to the committee. And so that informs the committee's discussion on the bill. All of this, Chair, will lead the committee up to what is called a motion of desirability, which is contained in 286. I, um, and I can read that. It says yeah. that the committee, after due deliberation, must consider a motion of desirability on the subject matter of the bill, and if rejected, must immediately table the bill and its report on the bill. Right? So that is, if you reject the, the, the bill after you've duly deliberated on the bill, the committee must immediately table the bill and its report on the bill. Jay says, if the motion of desirability is adopted, the committee can then proceed to deliberate on the details of the legislation. So those are the two um, aspects to a motion of desirability. Um, rule, I will now proceed to the rule 286, um, sub six. Sub six in essence informs the committee what is meant by due deliberation. Um, it, it sets out, um, the understanding of due deliberation, it says in the process of inquiring into the bill, the committee must, where applicable, and as far as possible, apply the following separate formal stages. So the first one will be an informal discussion on the principle and subject of the bill, including a briefing by the department concerned, and in the case of a member's bill, by the member concerned, which is what is happening today and considering of public comments that have been received. As I explained, if the member had received any public comments, that must also be presented to the bill. Um, the adoption of a, of a motion of desirability relating to whether the principles of the bill and the need of the bill are accepted. So it says that after those stages, the committee must then consider a motion of desirability relating to whether the principles of the bill and the need of the bill are accepted by the committee. Um, Chair, I think that is the process leading up to a motion desirability. Um, thank you. Thank and then, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Prince, for this input. is much appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Furnevald. Are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you, Chair. Over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, firstly, I want to start to refer to Section 92 of the Constitution. And the Constitution determines in Section 92 the accountability and the responsibilities when it comes to Cabinet. And I'm just going to read you uh, subsection 2. It says members of the mm -hmm. cabinet are accountable collectively and individually to parliament for the exercise of their powers and the performance of their functions. So bear in mind section 92 of our constitution. Now we must ask ourselves does parliament have an oversight role during a state of disaster? Specifically, when we talk about that, then we say, as for introduction, Chairperson, I want to start by saying by 30th of January 2020, the Director General of the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus 
outbreak the public health emergency of international concern? Following this announcement, the minister responsible for cooperative government and traditional affairs declared a national state of disaster in terms of section 27 of the Disaster Management Act and various sets of regulations were promulgated following the declaration of the national state of disaster, which imposed a national lockdown. Internationally, if we look at uh, legislation, the next slide, if we can have the next slide from uh, the secretary who managed the slide. Can you have the next slide, please? Who's doing that, colleagues? Shirin? Amanda? Right, right. There, there thank there you. Thank you. International responses to the COVID-19 pandemic have been varied. Whether an emergency or a state of emergency in law or a disaster was called seems to make a difference to the level in which restrictions can be and are imposed on citizens. So we have two issues here, uh, a disaster in terms of a, a state of emergency. The various reports of the excessive use of power by law enforcement and arguably unnecessary restrictions on the movement of goods and people calls into question whether South Africa is honoring its obligations as set out in international and regional instruments when we specifically refer to the African Charter on Human Rights and People's Rights. The human rights abuses that have been recorded to date stand in stark contrast to the African Charter that holds that no derogation on human rights can be made. This begs the question whether the country is in a state of a disaster or a state of emergency. When we move to South Africa situation, in South Africa, heads of state may call a state of emergency in law. So we have a state of emergency act, which is provided for in the constitution specifically Section 37, which is underpinned by rigorous parliamentary legislative processes and oversight. The South African government's choice to call the COVID-19 pandemic a state of disaster and not a state of emergency could be in part to avoid images of the brutal states of emergencies that were used in the 1980s to suppress public dissent. South Africa is a signatory to various international instruments on human rights, notably the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which allows signatories to take measures to derogate from the covenant, including limitations on human rights. However, South Africa is also a signatory to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which stands in stark contrast to the ICCPR in that it does not allow states of emergency nor the possibility of derogations on human rights. South Africa is a constitutional democracy where the people's voice, voices should be heard through the elected parliament as well as public participation. We as members of parliament should be heard uh, by our constituents. Now, if we look, for instance, at the impact of the national state of disaster, which we had on the next slide, then can we have the next slide? Now, it's the one before that. That's it. The impact of the national state of disaster. It seems I have a problem with that. Let me continue, Chair. The national state of disaster, as well as accompanying regulations, had severe consequences and a negative impact on the lives of every citizen in South Africa. Citizens' basic human rights were restricted and certain behaviors and actions were prohibited. The economic consequences were disastrous and millions of people lost their jobs. This might or might not have been necessary 
to save lives. Some regulations are regarded as rational and necessary, and other in public opinion were irrational and not aligned with the goal to flatten the curve of the viral infection rate. The people, however, do have a say. Their voices are not heard, and Parliament as elected by the people to ensure accountability and oversight has no role in approving regulations on scrutinizing the rationality of such. If we look at the legislative accountability, the Disaster Management Act does not currently provide adequate legislative accountability and oversight over the regulations published in terms of it. The duration of a state of disaster, nor in respect of the extinction of a state of disaster. And I want to emphasize that we say there is no adequate legislative accountability and oversight from Parliament. In a constitutional democracy, any legislation and the regulations promulgated in terms of such, which has such severe consequences and which impacts on the citizens and their human rights should be subject to more legislative accountability, scrutiny and oversight. The People's Parliament, which should be an activist legislature and champion democracy, may not allow legislation to create a void in terms of oversight and accountability. Now, if we come to the bill, Honorable Chair, what are the objects of the bill? The objects are firstly to amend the Disaster Management Act in order to amend the duration of a state of disaster. Furthermore, the bill seeks to provide that only the National Assembly, the provincial legislature or the municipal council may resolve to extend the declaration of a national, a provincial or a local state of disaster respectively and for how long. So we recognize all three spheres of government. The bill also provides for the requisite majorities required in the National Assembly, the Provincial Legislature and the Municipal Council in order to extend the respective state of disasters. And then also the bill further provides that the resolution to extend a national, provincial or a local state of disaster may only be adopted after a public debate. The bill finally seeks to provide for oversight by the National Assembly over a national state of disaster and consequent regulations and oversight uh, by a provincial legislature regarding a provincial state of disaster. Chairperson, I refer again to section 92.2 of the constitution about oversight. And the main reason for this bill is that we say that South Africa's parliament should be an activist legislature championing democracy and ensuring accountability and oversight. So Chairperson, that is in short what the aim and the objects of this bill is. And I suppose we will go into more detail uh, and I hand back to you in as chair. Thank you, colleague, Dr. Kornevelt. Thank you so much for the presentation. Can I find out from you whether you obtained some public comments since this bill was 80th in February? Dr. Kornevelt? Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair, I received only one um, public comment I don't know from uh, the legal advisor and the speaker's office, I've asked and I didn't receive any inputs from them. Uh, so there was only one, uh, but it was not specifically, uh, can I say, it was a more broad input on the act as such. You will see that my presentation and my bill aims only to deal with the issue of accountability, not other issues. 
So I don't know whether the legal advisor, whether they have received any further input. Mr. Prince, did you have sight of such public comment? Um, thank you, Chair. No, um, our office in the general course don't receive the public comments. And in this case, we didn't receive any either. Thank you, Chair. Mm. Okay. Dr. Kronewald, are you able to share with us uh, that public comment may be just for us to consider as we'll be progressing to, to look at these issues. Like you said, yes. it's very broad, it's not specific, but uh, maybe I'm subjected to be advised by the legal advisor as well. In the case, because I know in terms of legislation amendment, there has to be public comment. Uh, like I said, uh, Mr. Prince, this is for the first time. Who deals with the issue of the advertisement and also then uh, the calling for public comments, Mr. Prince? Because the rules seem to be silent on that one. It just says the member must have. Does the parliament has a role to play to assist for the publication? What happens under the like we do with the other ones? Um, sorry, Chair, the audio was a bit distorted for the first part, but I think I got the gist of the question. Um, yes. Chair, the, the member is responsible for, and, um, and the rules do provide for the member to be responsible for the publication of the um, information or bill before he introduces the bill. Once the bill is introduced, whatever steps need to be taken with regards to public comment um, falls to the committee. Um, if you look at Rule 286, 286 says, in this case, the bill itself, and, and the member can correct me, I, I, I do think that the bill itself was not, in fact, published, but an explanatory memo of the bill was published. So 286 makes provision for when a bill is not published and the committee feels that it needs to get more inputs on the bill. There is a provision there that the committee can publish the bill for public comments, 286.2. Um, this is obviously a decision that the committee needs to take. It is a, um, yeah, it is a discretion. It is not, it's not an obligation on the committee to do so. 286 is discretionary. It says the committee may do so. So in deliberating on the bill, if the committee feels that after the input from the member, um, and the input from the Department on Organ of State, it still feels that it needs some more information. It could very well um, guide for public comments on the bill. Thank you, Chair. Yes, that's that's fair enough. That's what the clarity that one wanted to get. Maybe can we get um, Dr. Tao to comment? before we deal with the issue of public comments. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Good morning to your Chairperson. Uh, good morning to all honorable members. Good morning to Dr. Hrunavald and to all the support team and my colleagues from the department. Uh, honorable Chair, we are uh, going to make an input based on the mandate that uh, we received from our minister uh, on the on the bill as shared with the department. We also just want to underscore chair that uh, in the memorandum on the objects of the bill that Honorable Hrunavald has tabled, we indeed know that uh, section five states that none of the departments, bodies, or persons were consulted. So we therefore want to confirm that we were not formally consulted in the course of conceptualizing the, the proposals that manifested the bill, but we'll respond based on what uh, has been put before us uh, on behalf of our minister. We have prepared a PowerPoint presentation uh, for record uh, honorable chair and members. 
uh, which I'm going to request my colleague, Ms. Anne Brewer, to, to table. I thought before she could do that, I can just talk to five issues that serve to contextualize uh, the disaster management function and the, the spirit, the latent spirit of the law as it relates to the function within our constitutional jurisprudence. Um, firstly, that the, the paradigm for disaster management function should be understood that uh, the paradigm of disaster management takes two forms. The first form is the development focus, which is basically about uh, risk proofing development using proactive measures such as assessing uh, risks in various areas and making sure that you develop plans to proactively uh, mitigate or even prevent the occurrence of risks. The second uh, stream of the paradigm is the response focus. The response focus, as we will all agree, deals with uh, acting swiftly or promptly to uh, respond to any life-threatening occurrences, life or property-threatening uh, occurrences. And these are measures that require that we have quick uh, mechanisms for taking action and they are provided for in terms of states of uh, disaster. So the second issue that I want to highlight is the scope of application of the disaster management uh, function, both in the country and, and globally as disaster management, uh, especially the risk management um, approach to managing uh, disasters was ushered in following the adoption of the uh, Bradland Report, which introduced the sustainable development paradigm uh, globally. So the, the application of the function is for non-security hazards, which are your natural hazards and anthropogenic or human-made hazards. And we should um, bear in mind that non-security hazards, which are mostly natural, uh, are categorized into two. There are slow onset hazards and there are sudden onset hazards. So slow onset hazard is uh, hazards like drought, which creeps in over time um, and where you can have time to plan sufficiently, introduce certain measures. But sudden onset hazards is those that happen abruptly and require that you take quick action. Um, and you must have a, a proper or an enabling legislative mechanism to, to take um, actions um, when, when those sudden onset hazards occur. You know, it's uh, uh, hazards such as your side loans, uh, the COVID uh, situation that we're dealing with, which require that a quick action should be taken by the national executive. And we also just want to state in terms of the scope of application that we also are supporting the security cluster in terms of various security operations. And, and I think the reason why you see the State of Secure Emergency Act still mentioning disaster issues is because it's an old order piece of legislation uh, which uh, predates the Disaster Management Act. We, we expect that when it gets um, reviewed, the, the, the focus on disasters will be taken out. So uh, the third issue that I want to highlight relates to the philosophy of the function that is grounded on section 24 of the constitution, which is about uh, ensuring that everyone has a right to an environment that is safe and secure for their well-being. Uh, and of course, the other focus in terms of the philosophies sustainable, uh, risk-proof in sustainable development. If you look at the, um, the 17 goals and the targets of the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, you realize that there are about 25 indicators that have to do with disaster risk management in about uh, 10 of the uh, 17 sustainable development goals. It shows that achieving all um, 
goals of the uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, you need uh, disaster risk management uh, through proactive measures uh, that are referred to as the developmental focus, but also being backed by response focus so that you are able to correct uh, life-threatening and property-threatening situations. Um, I've already made the point about the State of Emergency Act that still refers to disaster, disaster issues, natural disaster issues that is because it's an old order piece of legislation. That's why it still contains that. And now with the existence of the Disaster Management Act, the paradigm around dealing with natural hazards uh, uh, falls within the purview of the Disaster Management, uh, disaster management Act. So in terms of the regulatory uh, arrangements under the Disaster Management Act, uh, and I think this is what uh, brought uh, to light this discussion. There are two paradigms in terms of the regulatory arrangements. Uh, the Act in Section 59 provides that uh, regulations can be made to deal with matters uh, relating to disaster, uh, disaster management. And when you go into that section, uh, we realize that there's a provision in section 59, subsection four, uh, that states that any regulations made by the minister in terms of subsection one must be referred to the National Council of Provinces for purposes of section 146.6 of the constitution. So that is the first paradigm for uh, regulatory arrangements we already have a regulation on volunteers that went through that uh, whole process. The second paradigm in terms of the regulatory arrangements is uh, regulations under the state of disaster. And I think in its wisdom, uh, parliament uh, realized that when you deal with a life-threatening occurrence, you need to have uh, put in place mechanism for quick decision-making so that you, you protect uh, life, property, and uh, secure the, the Republic uh, in line with the, the provisions of Section 24 of the Constitution. It is against this basis that we will be tabling our, uh, the, the minister's um, uh, input to this discussion, and which by and large points to the fact that uh, the, the portfolio of cooperative governance and traditional affairs does not support uh, the bill as, as, as tabled um, in its current form. With your permission, Chairperson, I would like to request that um, Mrs. Brewer be allowed to table uh, the presentation. Thank you very much. Where is the presentation? I wonder what happened, Dr. Tao. It's unlike you that we don't receive the presentations in advance. What happened? Uh, apologies, Chairperson. We finalized it uh, midnight and we, we thought we needed some clearance before it can be circulated. We sincerely apologize and I'll send it through to the Secretariat. Can you do it then in the meantime so that people can be able to refer to what you are saying? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, apologies yes. okay. But you can put it on the screen for now. You can proceed now, it's on the screen. Good morning, um, honorable chairperson and honorable members. My name is Anna Brevard, as Dr. Tao uh, indicated, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to state the position of the National Disaster Management Center um, on, the, on the Disaster Management Am Amendment Bill as um, introduced as a private members bill. So, 
I just want to make sure that, that it is shown on the screen. It was, then you decided to show your picture, uh, Anne. <laughs> uh, the presentation was there. Okay, load it again. Okay, I'm not sure, will the secretary share the presentation? Yes. Yes, proceed now. Okay, thank you. All right, so thank you very much. You can proceed to the next uh, slide. So basically the purpose of this presentation is just to provide the National Disaster Management Census position um, as in, uh, on, the, on the amendment bill that was introduced as a private member's bill as I've indicated. So um, uh, the first introduction part, if you can just go to the previous slide. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Grunewald already alluded to the uh, memorandums of the objects of the bill. Uh, maybe I can perhaps just go to uh, D, that it says um, citizens' basic human rights were restricted and certain behaviours and actions were prohibited uh, in, according to the memorandum of the objects. Um, the economic consequences were disastrous and also the Disaster Management Act does not currently provide adequate legislative accountability and oversight over the regulations published in terms of it, the duration of a state of disaster, nor in respect of the extension of the state of the disaster. So um, these are the, the arguments that have been put uh, forward by uh, Dr. Grunewald, so we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, they want to provide that, uh, that a res resolution to extend the national, provincial or local state of disaster as the case may be, may only be adopted after a public debate in the respective legislatures. These items also come directly from the objects of the bill, so I'm not going to dwell into them, so we can move on to the next slide, please. So that, that brings us to the national disaster management position and, and our response in general. So we have the authority in terms of section 15 of the, of the Disaster Management Act to make recommendations on draft legislation affecting the Act. So that is what we are also um, intending to do. So having considered the proposals and the effect the bill may have on the disaster management function, and also having considered the court findings and other affirmative cases and their effect on the bill, uh, we want to provide the following position in response to the uh, portfolio committee's request to process the bill. So we, I think it's important that we note that the courts during 2020 and 21, in the De Beer case, the ESO case, the Freedom Front Plus case, the Helen Zuzman Foundation and the Democratic Alliance case, which are all cited um, at the bottom of the, the slide, adjudicated on key aspects regarding the interpretation and implementation of sections 27, 41 and 55 of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, these provisions deal with the states of disasters in the, uh, you know, the various uh, spheres of government and um, which have detrimental consequences in the view of the Disaster Management Centers Center for the proposals put forward by the bill. If you go to the next slide, we just highlight um, the legal precedent on the Disaster Management Act um, that was set by the courts. So in the Ellen Sussman Foundation case, the court held that parliament properly delegated the regulation making power in terms of disaster management to the executive which fits into the broad constitutional scheme. In the Democratic Alliance case, the court also held that since it is near impossible for parliament to legislate in advance ways and means to deal with sudden unforeseen calamities, it is best for it to delegate some of its legislative functions. It concluded that the executive is better placed to deal rapidly, effectively and comprehensively with disasters in a way parliament cannot do. 
especially if parliament is not in session when a disaster strikes. So that uh, deals directly with the, with the issues that were raised uh, you know, in the memorandum of the objects of the bill. In the ESO case, the court indicated that the construction of the act makes perfect sense because it contemplates the situation of a national disaster where regulations have to be made to give effect to containment of the harm caused by a national disaster. The implementation thereof would invariably have to be brisk in circumstances where the declaration is not permanent. There was a, a, another Democratic Alliance case where the court also found that there is sufficient oversight mechanisms for Parliament to ensure that the Minister stays within the restraints imposed by the Disaster Management Act, both when making regulations and when also considering the extension of the national state of disaster. <clears throat> In the Freedom Front Plus case, um, the court held that the difference between regulation making and executive oversight is distinct. One of the roles of the National Assembly is to scrutinize and oversee executive action and that the national state of disaster does not render this provision in a, inoperable. It was also recognized that states of disaster cover a wide range of different circumstances and that the Disaster Management Act do not permit deviation from the constitutional order and therefore, unlike a state of emergency, do not suspend rights but may temporarily limit rights within the provisions of Section 36 of the Constitution when those limitations are a consequence of dealing with the effects of the disaster. <clears throat> the next slide. Okay, okay so I think um, these uh, legal precedents make it quite clear that the Disaster Management Act is appropriate and, and, and deals with the necessary uh, provisions um, and, and provides for adequate oversight. So, if we look at the particular clauses, uh, um, uh, firstly on clause one, which seeks to amend section 27 of the act by providing inter alia that a national state of disaster may be effective only prospectively and for no more than 21 days, unless the National Assembly resolve otherwise. A minister may terminate a national state of disaster before it lapses and a copy of the notice declaring national state of disaster must be tabled in the National Assembly and also that the National Assembly may disapprove of any regulations or directions made under such a declaration or may make recommendations to the minister pertaining to such regulations and directions. I think this clause is, is the core of, of, of the uh, issues that, that the um, private members bill intends to address. So we would like to uh, indicate that the, these amendments are not recommended as it, is fundament, as it fundamentally shifts responsibility to extend a national state of disaster and alters the process and therefore also the speed of making regulations and directions. And that is contrary to the intention of dealing with a disaster uh, rapidly and effectively. The NDMC also believes the proposed amendments, amendments will significantly hamper the efficiency of taking action when needed um, to advance the object, objectives of declaring a state of disaster. And these are also listed, the objectives are listed under sections 27, 41 and 55 of the Act. The next slide. Uh, it is also, <laughs> so uh, what we want to say in addition, it is also important to note that the current act already provides that the national state of disaster is only effective prospectively and is initially valid, valid for three months. So there's no need for a, a, a specific statement to indicate that it is only valid prospectively because that is indeed the case. Experience in other states of disaster, such as drought and floods that we have uh, dealt with um, also in the, over the past year, has proved that this three-month time period is often necessary 
to bring about the required interventions. Limiting this initial period for, to 21 days as proposed in the bill would therefore be counterproductive. Currently, uh, the Minister of uh, Gokta may extend the national state of disaster on a month-to-month -month basis after the initial three months validity period. The proposed change to reallocate this power to the National Assembly will hamper such a decision, especially if the National Assembly is in recess. The, the Minister, in terms of Section 275B of the existing Act, has the authority to terminate the national disaster even before it lapses as well. So the, the concept therefore of affording the National Assembly the power to extend the national state of disaster, but retain the minister's power to terminate the national sta state um, is therefore in our view not rational. The next slide. <clears throat> um, the bill also argues that uh, uh, tabling a copy of the notice uh, declaring a national state of disaster in the National Assembly is, uh, is required, um, but we support that only to the extent that it serves to promote oversight of the executive in terms of Section 55 of the Constitution. So the amendment proposed to afford the National Assembly the power to disapprove any of the regulations or directions is not supported as it will negatively affect the speed at which the required regulations are to be made. So basically, we say that uh, it is supported that the National Assembly, as part of the existing oversight of the executive, may make the recommendations to the minister on the regulations or directions that are already issued by the minister and all regulations um, that may be required. And I think that is currently also the case and the National Assembly um, can indeed uh, make such recommendations within the current mechanisms. Um, if we go to clause two, it seeks to insert uh, another section by providing for regulations or directions to cease to be of force once the national state of disaster lapses and the validity, validity of anything done under or by virtue of any regulation or direction from the time of the declaration of the national state of disaster to the time it lapses. So once again, these amendments are not recommended as it is already implied by section 27.3 of the Disaster Management Act, that once the basis no longer exists on which this decision has been made to declare a state of disaster, or to extend it, any regulations or directions uh, to deal with that disaster is no longer needed and as such would cease to be in force. Similarly, any restrictions or powers afforded by the regulations only exist as long as the regulations um, and directions are in force, prospectively from the date of its pub publication and to the date the state of disaster lapses or is terminated. So the reasons put forward for not supporting the allocation of power to the National Assembly to disapprove uh, any of the regulations is also applicable to this clause. If we uh, go to clause three, um, I'm not going to do, uh, go into detail of that because it is basically a, um, a duplication of, of uh, the previous clauses. Uh, just that it is applicable at the provincial level. And so once again, these amendments are not recommended as it is also fundamentally shifts to responsibility to extend the provincial state of disaster and all this, the process of making regulations and directions, uh, making it longer. So the, the same arguments that we have for the previous um, clauses for national uh, level state of disasters are also applicable for provincial state of disasters. So if we go then to the next um, slide. So this clause four seeks to uh, also add those, those provisions uh, similar to the clause two of the, uh, that refers to the national state. So once again, these amendments are not recommended for the same reasons uh, for not supporting the amendments proposed to clause two. 
The next slide. Uh, is specifically uh, applicable for local states of disasters um, and, and is based on the same principles as discussed on the national and provincial state of disaster. And once again, it is not recommended because it, it fundamentally shifts the responsibility to extend and also alters the process of making bylaws and directions and making it much longer. So in, in, in practical terms, I think it's also important just to note that a number of councils have recognized that it is not ideally placed to deal rapidly, effectively and comprehensively with a disaster in a way the executive of a municipality can, especially if the council is not in session when a disaster strikes. Subsequently, councils have delegated the power to declare a local state of disaster to the mayor and or mayoral committee. So they have even recognized the need for speedy, speedily intervention. And that is why they have delegated the function um, accordingly. So the proposals to, you know, to make the process even longer does not really um, make sense to deal with the, the rapid decision making that is required for dealing with disasters. We go to the next slide, <coughs> please. So uh, once again, clause six is similar, um, uh, you know, with the uh, and just applicable on the um, local government level. So it is not um, recommended or supported. The next slide. So basically, what we're saying in conclusion is that the minister a premier and a council is sufficiently empowered by sections 27, 41 and 55 of the Disaster Management Act to make regulations, bylaws and directions. The courts have also found that the assignment of these functions is constitutional and functional and that sufficient mechanisms currently exist both in the Act, the Constitution within other legislation such as PIA and within the structures of parliament, provincial legislatures and councils to perform adequate oversight of, on the work of the executive. So I think that is a very important point and that has already been um, confirmed in our, in our legislative system. So um, the legislature should continue with its ordinary functions as far as possible it also needs to scrutinize the executive's application of its delegated powers to help ensure that legislative measures are in line with the rule of law. So nothing needs to change. That is basically what we're saying. The bill in um, its current format seeks to alter the system in a way that may be counterproductive and hamper the speed and efficiency with which a disaster should be managed and taking into consideration all these um, uh, conclusions that we've made, we recommend that the Portfolio Committee do not support the bill as it has been introduced as a private member's bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Brewer. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. You can then mute the video and get out of the screen. Thank you. Before I allow members and propose any way forward on this matter, because on our side, the difficulty I think is the, us having to digest what is being presented to us now. Also then, but uh, maybe before that, let me allow Dr. Kornaval if there are issues that based on the response you want to raise, so that will give you that opportunity again in response to what the department has said. Then I'll therefore propose the way forward how do we process this further. 
Thank you, Chair. Over to you, Dr. Levant. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Chair, yes, uh, I did not receive the presentation beforehand, but let me start by saying that the golden thread in the presentation uh, from uh, the NDMC is in fact that it says and uh, it says that it will hamper the efficiency uh, of regulations and it also takes the responsibility uh, actually away from the specific minister. Now, let me first say, Honorable Chair, if you look, for instance, on the whole issue of hampering uh, and the speedy actions to be taken, if you look at section 37 of the constitution and you look at the situation of a state of emergency, uh, then we must also ask us what is actually a state of emergency and in what way does it differ from a state of disaster? Now, it says in section 37 of the constitution a state of emergency may be declared only in terms of an act of parliament, which there is, and only when the life of the nation is threatened by war, invasion, general insurrection, disorder, and then very important, national disaster or other public emergency. Now, Chair, if you look at the state of Emergency Act, it also includes a natural disaster. And if you look at the Disaster Management Act, it also deals with a natural disaster. So in South Africa, we have two pieces of legislation who can deal with a natural disaster. And that is what I want to put emphasis on. The COVID-19 is seen as a natural disaster. Now, the arguments from the NDMC to say, but we cannot uh, act speedily. Uh, we cannot deal rapidly with certain issues. It's not correct, Chairperson, because the Constitution of South Africa says that in the case of a state of emergency that is also a state of disaster, it can be dealt with and he gives 21 days to the president and then he must come to parliament. Now, my question will be, how is it possible that we already have a piece of legislation? We have a constitution that determines that yes, even if we have a natural disaster, that you still have to comply to the oversight and the accountability to parliament. But the arguments now from the NDMC is they cannot do it. I don't think that is correct, Chairperson. If the state of an emergency has to deal also with a natural disaster, if that can happen, which is already in legislation, to ensure that they can be rapidly take actions rapidly taken, that the responsibility of the relevant minister in this specific uh, Disaster Management Act. Yes, she can declare for 21 days, but then you can act speedily, rapidly. But the aim of this amendment bill, Honorable Chair, is then to say, but then you will have to come to Parliament and account. I hear all the arguments in terms of but Parliament is not in session then. And I also want to refer to the different court cases. May I also just say that uh, those, uh, some of those court cases are not uh, uh, only completed. There may be appeals. There are some appeals in some of uh, those court cases. But the court cases, they've looked at the present situation as far as the act is concerned. And that's part of the problem, that we have to amend the act and therefore an amendment bill so that we can ensure 
that there is more accountability. In some of these court cases, Honorable Chair, what happened? The courts said, yes, but the minister can be called by this Kochta Portfolio Committee to come and account. But Chairperson, you all have the experience. Well, firstly, I am aware of the fact that the minister did not always appear in front of this Kochta on this Portfolio Committee. Secondly, if the minister appear or the department appears uh, to this portfolio committee, they say, well, these are the regulations. This is what we are going to do. This committee does not have the power to accept or reject it. For instance, if they come to this committee now as the act uh, determines, and they said, well, these are the regulations we are going to issue, and you differ from that, then the minister said, thank you, we take note of your difference on our regulation, but we continue. The committee representing parliament, representing the people, don't have the authority, as the act stands now, to change any regulation, whether they agree with it or not. And that is the issue which is on hand with this amendment bill. If the constitution of South Africa determines that even in a case of a state of an emergency, which includes a national disaster, and the fact that it can be a natural disaster, if that provides, but there can be rapid action, but the accountability must come to parliament, then I differ with the presentation from the NDMC because it can be dealt with. We already have legislation that determines that it can be dealt with. They will have to comply to the accountability. And that, Honorable Chair, and to the Honorable Members, is what accountability is. So just to come and say, well, it's going to hamper uh, the efficiency uh, and we cannot act rapidly, uh, as far as I'm concerned, those are not valid reasons not to accept the amendments. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I, I'm also then tempted to say, because we got this thing now, definitely we cannot apply our minds also to say maybe that, that will give you an opportunity, Dr. Kronewald, to also respond on the issues as raised by the department. And then the reality on the state of the emergency act. I shall think when we, we dealt with the National Disaster Management Act, that act should have then been amended so that those issues of natural disasters that are there, then because already now they are again enacted on the, on the Disaster Management Act. I'm saying this because if you look on the traditional uh, and cohesion leadership act, it is explicitly managed to amend the Structures Act. And then I should think that's the route the department should have followed when they deal with the uh, National Disaster Management Act to also on those issues that are referred to. Uh, 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 so that, that, that's why I'll agree with you that there's a need for the amendment of the State of Emergency Act then. And then I think we could use this opportunity to deal with that, to bring those issues that are there on the State of Emergency State of Emergency Act to that effect. Then I, I also should think to say the information that has been submitted to us as well as a committee, we're getting it now. We need to also go through it uh, like uh, Dr. Tao, because I should also then uh, apologize up front to say also yourself, Dr. Kornival, you were not given ample time to do that presentation because you. I know I was told uh, you got this with, not within the 24 hour period requirement. 
but they shouldn't have apologized yet. Problem of committee secretary with their gadgets because we discussed about these things last week to say now that that matter was eight is it in February. And now that we'll also be going through a very long process a long recess for elections. At least we must get some work to be done so that maybe then if then we are to reconvene. So because you are saying you only got one, 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 one uh, representation, I should think now ourselves as a committee, we should subject this to public consultation. I think we'll take over as a committee. Then we, we subject this to public consultations. Let's hear the views. Because in reality, we all agree there's been a lot of concerns, especially where in provinces in particular when it comes to the issue of accountability. And we had that experience, I will agree with you, Dr. Kurnel, but in this committee, where in people come and tell us things that are not there in provinces, without an enabling tool to, 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 to foster accountability, uh, I think, because also I like the department to unpack, because I know, maybe let me allow you to do that, Dr. Dow. In the response here, you will say this is covered by section 27, for instance. Then you don't go in detail to expatiate what section 27 actually means and why this thing cannot stand safe to say that you say it's not supported. I think you must also assist us as a committee to come to a decision. But then I think because of the time, factor, or maybe had members got the opportunity to read these things, they will have been in a better position to probe further. Uh, I should think I need to be advised by um, Mr. Prince on this matter, uh, on the issue of public participation, because um, we know that they are not obligatory or mandatory, but uh, because I don't want us to also proceed to vote on the motion of desirability without any public comment, because that's what we are guided off. Uh, and then the other issue, there are various uh, role players, like uh, the local government itself, Salga, and then uh, we need to give them an opportunity to also reflect on this bill and the implication on the on the on on this on the implications of municipality. So that's why I'm saying we cannot say now we're voting on the on the motion of desirability now. I think to hear Salga's view, I see Salga was is also here. I wonder if there was a presentation, but you didn't send it to us. Lance, I've seen Lance is also here from Salga. I saw some colleagues from Salga here. I wonder if they are also ready to comment or Lance. See, Chapson, oh. Chapson, good morning, greetings to you and the members of the committee, as well as the Honorable Kronova uh, and the, the colleagues from COPTA. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, we are not in a position uh, to reflect substantively on the issues raised, but we would love an opportunity because, as you correctly pointed out, there's a material impact on local government, and we would like a, an opportunity to contribute, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Yes. So I'll say then we are, we'll take charge of this bill. And now that uh, Dr. Kronewald has presented it to the committee, to say less than uh deal with this issue so that we get comments more comments from the people out there having got more comments as the committee then we can 
yeah, like Salga has got an interest as well as uh, they've indicated. There will also be municipalities themselves that has got interest on these matters. So we should then deal with that so that uh, we can then later vote on the motion of desi desirability, having more information on these matters. Uh, am I wrong, uh, Mr. Prince, on this matter to say we can first get more information and then later vote on the motion of desirability with more facts, more different views on the matter, all various stakeholders being consulted? Over to you. Um, no, Chair, I won't say that you're incorrect. Like I said previously, um, um, the rules, in fact, afford the committee the discretion to do so. The rules, and and I think the committee secretary could maybe come in as well because through the public participation unit, um, they could better advise the committee what exactly what type of um, public involvement mechanisms can be used because the rule um, says that the committee, there are various uh, mechanisms set out in the rule invitations, press statements, advertisements, or any other manner of ways to invite the public to comment on it. I think um, the committee, of course, is best placed to determine whether it needs more information, and if it deems it so, then public participation is the best route to do so. Thank you, Chair. I think that's fair enough, because that will also give us an opportunity to deal with this state of emergency act under the circumstances, because like I said, the way the TKLA has been drafted, it also amended, and that has been the expectation that our National Disaster Management Act could have also amended those sections that deals with disaster in the in the in the state of emergency act as one reason. Because actually, as Dr. Kronewald puts it, we're somehow in a state of emergency, uh, Dr. Dow. Though I want you to quickly comment before we close, we somehow during that level five lockdown, what difference was it from the state of emergency? If I was to ask, though the only requirement the state of emergency had to be declared by parliament, I think that's the only slight difference there. But in reality, we're like in sort because there were no movement, there was nothing. So le, 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 I think I need to, you to also comment, Dr. Tau, but you can hear my view here because uh, there were other two colleagues that they said they had interest on the matter. Like, you will finally manage to log in, uh, Princess Butelis. I've seen you for quite some time. I realized you were struggling to, I, I did to connect. I did. Yes, thank you for that. Sorry about that. It has sometimes these networks can mess you up. So, Dr. Dow, can you comment then without me dictating? Let me also hear the other colleagues' views. I don't want to dictate to colleagues, though I've expressed my views, and then I, that's why I had to check it also with a the Parliament legal advisor to that effect. Dr. Tao, comment on the issue of the State of Emergency Act vis-a-vis -vis your Disaster Management Act, and maybe the various sections that you are saying, this is that, so that you expatiate further, so that members, as and when they read these things, they are able to understand it. Over to you, okay. Dr. Dao and the team as the leader of the delegation, not you specifically. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thank you for your reflections and for guiding us on how we can support this process going forward. I think I'll just raise three issues my colleagues may wish to come in. Uh, the first matter is you, the Chairperson's um, uh, assertion that uh, the state in which we are or we have been under level five may have been equivalent to a state of uh, emergency. 
given now this is my inference, the level of uh, restrictions that are applied. Chairperson, uh, as we indicated, the disaster management function deals with all hazards. And hazards impact communities in different uh, forms, implying that the measures for uh, responding to various hazards in order to protect the public will also vary. And I think we will all appreciate that uh, COVID is a novel virus, very highly contagious uh, uh, virus required that um, certain uh, peculiar measures be put in place to make sure that uh, the spread of this respiratory uh, disease is, 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 is curtailed using the, um, the measures that cabinet has adopted, uh, flattening the curve, um, uh, the risk adjusted strategy that is currently being uh, applied and so on and so forth. But I think every time we look at the measure uh, that has been put in place, we should uh, look at it in the context of uh, the, the constitutional imperative for the country to protect the public. And Disaster Management Act in section 27, just for a national state of disaster, it's very clear in terms of the objectives that uh, you the, the executive should be pursuing in putting in place the measures. And those objectives are listed as assisting and protecting the, the public, providing relief to the public, protecting property, preventing or combating disruption, dealing with the destructive and other effects of the disaster. So we are um, convinced that all the measures that have been taken were in pursuit of ensuring that the public uh, is protected. Uh, so whether someone may interpret those as state of emergency or, or, or state of disaster, I think it's something that we can continue debating. But let's also note that right with this section, if you go to section 15, uh, you will notice that there's a subsection that provides for the National Disaster Management Center to call in the SAPS and SANDF to support it in, in carrying out um, various operations on disaster management. And that's where there could be an interpretation or an inference that uh, that uh, appeared to be a state of emergency operation. Basically, it's just to make sure that uh, we reinforce the, the work of the disaster management a sector because it is not a security cluster, but it can perform uh, some of its functions well if supported by the security establishment. The section is uh, section 15.2AA, which says, in any event of a disaster or a potential disaster, NDMC can call on the South African National Defense Force, South African Police Service, and any other organ of state to assist the disaster management structures. That's the first point I wanted to make, Chairperson. Uh, the second issue was it's in relation to the Chairperson's comment that in, in one of our the responses of the department, we might still need to elaborate. I think um, we take note of that. And I wanted to just submit that for purposes of our preparations, as will be guided by our minister, if we could get, you know perhaps from the committee, a list of issues that uh, we, we, we should dwell on so that we are able to, to really be as comprehensive as possible, but also relevant to the issues that um, uh, are of interest uh, on this matter. And then the last one, uh, it's about this Disaster Management Act versus the state of emergency. We deal with non-security issues. I think we are on the same page there. And our reading of the State of Emergency Act is that it therefore has to deal with security matters. Just to also note that the State of Emergency Act does not fall within the purview of our uh, the portfolio of our minister. It's in the security cluster. I'll just confirm whether it's uh, SAPS, Justice, or which specific department, but that we, we, can, we can confirm, implying that our engagements on, um, 
on this matter will also require that we syndicate with the security uh, cluster so that there can be that alignment and I think we'll, we'll support that process as well. So that is in a nutshell, the comments that I would like to make Chairperson. Thank you very much. And if any of my colleagues would like to comment uh, with your permission, um, we welcome that. Thank you very much. Dr. Tau, I know you know before the colleagues can comment. Is there anyone who want to comment before that? You seem to have covered. In the act as it is now, before I allow the other co committee colleagues to, 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 to comment on these matters, is there any provision on the role of the legislature? The current act of 57 of 2002, as it is. Is that a, a question to ask, Chairperson? Yes. Uh, is there any provision that deals with the legislature's rule? Okay. No, thank you, Chair. I think in our response to uh, to the bill, we we attempted to indicate that a Parliament oversight. Um, uh, still applies to the to the work of the uh, executive and of course our the, the head of our portfolio as in the in the form of the minister hands she would often appear to the committee to brief on various matters relating to her portfolio and i also pointed out that in decision making about about the regulations when you go to section 59 of the act it provides for the making of regulations uh, in dealing with normal processes of implementing the disaster management function. And for those regulations, uh, the act is prescriptive that they should be uh, tabled to the uh, National Council of Provinces. Uh, that is section 59. So that is where now various regulations will have to go through uh, that process. But the regulations to deal with emergency response situations in order to save lives under the states of disaster, whether it's national state of disaster, provincial or municipal state of disaster. Those ones that do not provide for a, the long process because one can be delayed in making important decisions to, to, to save lives. And, and I think we cited an example that what if uh, parliament is not able to convene or is on recess. For instance, with COVID, gatherings uh, uh, were, were not, certain numbers for gatherings were not allowed because they can also lead to uh, the increase in infections or transmission of the, of the virus. So how do you get parliament together? Uh, and this is just my, 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 my conclusion now. How do you get parliaments together when the virus that, or the dis disaster that you are dealing with is of such a nature that gatherings cannot take place. Um, uh, but let alone the fact that we now have this technological way of uh, convening meetings. So, so we, we just are going along those lines and we think that is what the legislature uh, considered. But when we, come, when we come back, Chairperson, we will have thoroughly consulted and we will also share, subject to uh, you know, protocols, the legal opinion that also informed the decision to go the Disaster Management Act route as opposed to the state of emergency route in deciding on the state of disaster on COVID. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay, members, is there anyone who wants to comment on this before we, while you are preparing to raise your hands, Dr. Tao? I've got this issue that I want to also raise. Section 59.4 reads, any regulations made by the minister in terms of subsection one must be referred to the National Council of Provinces 
for purposes of section 146 of the constitution. And then section 146 of the constitution says, a law made in terms of an act of parliament or provincial act can prevail if that law has been approved by the National Council of Provinces. I'm raising this now just for process, Dr. Tao, as you have indicated, this is the role of the legislatures. All those regulations as prescribed in 1591, uh, where they then referred to the NCOP in terms of the this provision that you referred to. Because when you read it in line with the section 146, six, but I'm mindful of the fact that there are court judgments to that effect. Maybe they've given that effect, then we we'll have to, to deal with that as we, we proceed. And then same thing. I see the NCOP. Is there any role played by the provincial legislatures in that effect when it comes to the implementing of this act? Also by local concerns. But we know we've done oversight, Dr. Tau, in some of the provinces. You know the status of our disaster management. The recent case we were together in the Northwest. I want to just understand this. I note the members that have that to say, from where you are seated, are you happy that the act as it is, it's an enabling tool for provinces and municipalities to comply? But yeah, this is your homework. Ne? We need to look at that and to respond to those questions. Honorable Spice. And then followed by Honorable Honeval in that order. Good morning, Chairperson. Yes, good to see you. Um, <laughs> Chairperson, um, first of all, good morning to all my colleagues and to everyone on the platform. Chairperson, I think it's important that um, we note your way forward and I'm not going to uh, disagree with you on that. I also just want to say that myself as a committee member and my colleague, uh, uh, Honorable Brink, obviously have a lot of interest in this matter and we are well prepared, And but we would like the opportunity also to engage with the information that was presented to us in order for us to um, elaborate or um, obviously actively um, engage in this. I want to say, Chair, that for uh, many of the points that were made by Dr. Tao, um, we could give him a, um, a very good case, um, and, you know, a total opposite case. So what we will leave that and reserve that for the opportunity that we will get again uh, when we reconvene for this matter. But this is a very important matter to us, and we must ensure that we, um, you know, uh, um, elaborate on this and discuss this very thoroughly. It cannot be something that is um, just dealt with. So thank you for the way in which you have um, recommended that we proceed. I agree with you on, on, on us not having to deal with it today until we have been um, given the opportunity to engage on or to um, familiarize ourselves with all the information that was given to us today. And last request, Chairperson, is that the officials, um, I would like them to really make sure that they have done adequate research and if they haven't done it, so do on all the jurisdictions. Um, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh,
Honorable, honorable, followed by Honorable Mpumza and Honorable Kaiser in that order. Honorable Kurnevald. Thank you, Chairperson. Not uh, Dr. Kurnevald, ne? Honorable <laughs> Kurnevald. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, my internet also is quite difficult, so if it's fine, I'll keep my video off. Um, Chairperson, I've listened to Dr. Tao as well, and um, I agree with my colleague to say that let's reserve and have a better uh, session for inputs. But I just want to say, Chair, to, to add that we are in a modern state um, in terms of technology, and I think uh, it's our job to propose ways that we can adopt um, in our current situation, in not only in terms of COVID, but in um, future disasters as well. Um, and let me reserve our input further on, on that, Chairperson, but uh, just a small input from my side. Thank you so much, Honorable Kornevald. Can I allow Honorable Mpumza to say something? Honorable Mpumza. Thanks, Chair. Yes. Thanks, Chair. And uh, good morning. Can to you, you Chair and the colleagues. Can you see properly as well? We can see your other eye. My other eye? We cannot see your left eye. Uh, your left eye, you are cut. Sit in the middle. Uh, are you seeing me, Chair? Now? Are you seeing me, Chair? Now? Yes, that's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Chair, and uh, uh, good morning to you, Chair, uh, honorable members. Uh, to, yes, uh, to go up a bit is the phone that they are using. I don't know who's in the laptop. No, it's a, it's a gadget, it's not the laptop. Yeah. Yeah. May I close the video because I could. Oops. Hello. Yes. Proceed. 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 Honorable Mpumza. Thanks, Chair. Proceed. Chair, I, I think that uh, uh, perhaps in order for us to apply our minds. Honorable uh, Mpumza. Yes, Chair Person. Hello, Chair. Uh -huh. Am I order to Chair Person? Whoa. Proceed. Thanks, Chair Person. Uh, Chair. Proceed, Honorable Proceed. Uh, Chairperson, I was to say yes, that. Uh, you are. Uh, proceed. Thank you. I was saying that uh, uh, given your input. Honorable Mpumza. Yes, Chairperson. I will. Chair, you have already indicated that uh, taking this. You say whatever you want to say. Chair, uh, I, I want to concur with other honorable members that, uh, that uh, given that uh, perhaps uh, with the presentation of the department that we have just received it now. Uh, once we have, uh, to some extent, we have uh, uh, read through uh, the private members' deal as provided, presented by Dr. Hunevat. Uh, for us, in order to do justice uh, to this, we think that uh, 
we will have another session as members of the committee so that we could apply our minds uh, thoroughly on this uh, disability for this particular bill. I then therefore concur with you that uh, it would be important also that uh, we subject this uh, private member's bill to a consultation process with other interested stakeholders. Uh, so that as the committee, we could also apply our minds after uh, thoroughly uh, in engaging this bill in another session, not now. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much, Honorable Pumsa. Can I allow Honorable Chair to take the podium, please? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, good, good. Good morning to the, my colleagues and honorable yourself, uh, and and honor and honourable members. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm 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 of the opinion that uh, we need ample time as the committee to go through clause by clause on this uh, complex um, uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, proposed amendments, so that uh, we can uh, ascertain the process because if we receive the information right now, we won't do much justice. And the fact that the, 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 the process has just been subjected to one person to comment uh, out of uh, 57 million people uh, is, uh, is undesirable for us to then uh, 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 ensure that uh, the process was thoroughly taken through by, by members of the committee. And uh, secondly, that uh, chairperson, uh, wa, uh, we would like to have uh, ourselves uh, uh, the, the the contents of the proposed amendments uh, in terms of the Disaster Management Act and the and the and the State of Emergency Act, so that uh, we we carefully go through as the committee, as we normally do uh, in terms of uh, given the the legal advice. That will then uh, 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 come on board to actually take us through clause by clause in terms of those proposed uh, uh, amendments into the bill. And uh, uh, we will reserve whatever we have. We have a, a lot ourselves uh, in terms of what it is uh, uh, about the Disaster Management uh, Act. And we'll reserve them as, as we go through uh, the amendments and, and uh, uh, we shall prepare as such, and uh, yeah, chairperson, uh, we, we we think that uh, it should it should go the route of the public uh, participation because there's nothing that we can uh, do much uh, to to put justice into the into the amendment. Uh, the public being involved uh, in the process, whether we are dealing with uh, in terms of um, the, the 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 current because I think that in municipalities the IDPs, uh, I was going to ask Dr. Dr. Dao, how are the IDPs now being processed in municipalities? Uh, you'd find out that they do that through the through the process of of virtual meetings, and so perhaps we uh, they should consider that and 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 consider if the IDPs in fact they are doing justice in terms of uh, the technologies that are whether everybody in the community do have those technologies and things like that. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay. So way forward, we are going to have ample time to look at the presentation. At the same time, we need to publish this for public comments, wherein we must give interested parties and institution an opportunity to comment on it. Uh, we have got various ways of doing that. We can invite interested parties to come, issue press statements with deadlines that people must comment and advertise. Those ways, I think yourself, this committee secretariat, will be able to deal with that. Uh, I, I think there's also a timeline to that. Uh, so that then we, we stick to the timeline so that we don't leave it open-ended. 
we have to deal with these matters. And I think our experience with the pandemic can also assist us to also then uh, relook at all these issues so that then we, at the end of the day, we, we have accountability, especially in the local sphere. It's well and good in the national sphere can be, but I'm still need to be schooled and Dr. Tao will share with us when we come back, how is this accountability in relation to this act? Is it in both the provincial and the local sphere? And also when I read 59.4, it seems this power only rests with the NCOP. Yes, and then, but we'll have to deal with that. But that doesn't tell the minister to account to us. That's the posture and attitude, Dr. Kronenwald, we've taken as a committee. I know there were times where there were resistance from some of the provinces to say, uh, this is the function of the NCOP, but we told them to say as a committee, we've got the sole responsibility to make sure that the disaster management act is complied with. So there were, those were some of the things, but even though when you do that, which is natural, uh, some do that for malicious compliance, because I want the situation where in, we have to enforce these matters, but we know that we can invoke the provisions of the powers and the privilege act for the national assembly and the legislatures to that effect. But then maybe it might be an opportunity to tighten and then also then bring that issue of the state of emergency act on matters that deals with the disaster because that act can be amended like what we've done in terms of the, I've given you the TKLA that automatically when the TKLA come into operation, then it amended section 81 of the structure act. So it's doable both way. Like somebody said, we are moving also with time and it is for the good reasons. And that will at the end of the day benefit our people. I think that's the approach we need to take. But like the colleagues have said, I've seen uh, Honorable Kaiser has interest on in this matter. There's a lot that they want to raise. The colleagues from the uh, colleagues, uh, Honorable Smith, Honorable Brink said that uh, they will have to raise issues and everybody will have an opportunity once having read uh, what the department is also saying. So we should end it here, colleagues, if, I will approve minutes Shirin and thank Dr. Kurnevant. We will then give you reasonable notice on time. It's a work in progress. So unless if you've got to say something before we release you so that we did, and you and at, uh, uh, Mr. Prince, the legal advisor, so that we deal with the other committee business then. Over to you, Dr. Kurnevant. Thank you, Honourable Chair and the Honourable Members. Uh, Chair, I fully agree with uh, the process forward. Uh, I think we have an opportunity and uh, we must hear what other institutions as well as the people uh, also want to comment. So I fully agree and uh, I want to thank uh, you and the Honourable Members uh, for the process forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Prince, anything to say before we release you? No, Chief, um, nothing further from me, no comment. Thank you. We just want to appreciate you to, for coming within the short period of time. We sincerely appreciate the support we always get from the parliamentary legal services. It's much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Kovrevald. You are excused. Shirin, can you load the minutes, please? Thank Dr. Tao, you wanted to say something before. Yeah. Sorry, my apologies. Dr. Uh, no, Chair. 
We also just want to thank you and the committee, and but we want to establish whether we can also take leave of the meeting. Yes, we want to okay. deal with the committee business now. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, your excuse. We always appreciate the support that you give us as a committee, Dr. Tao and the colleagues. Sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. So, Sharon, are we ready with the minutes? Sepo Mutale, Kimang, who's Sepo Mutale? Okay. Good morning, uh, Chaperson, uh, honorable members, <laughs> colleagues, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sepam Kali, ever... representing Saga. Uh, my name is Sepam Kali, representing your Saga. Hand is, your hand okay. has been up. Okay. Tell All right. Uh, I, I tried to raise my hand up, Chaperson, earlier when hey. you. you hey. Uh, expressed uh, uh, maybe you know, a, a view uh, whether other parties would like to also indicate uh, one or two things, including mm. Saga. So I raised my hand during that, that time uh, mm. just to, to respond, uh, Chair. So it's just to mention that as Saga, our mandate is to represent and protect interests of the local government sector and having assessed the presentation and the input by the National Disaster Management Center on the amendment of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, we welcome and support measures uh, in this regard uh, so that we can improve our state of disaster preparedness. Uh, we also share a view that there is a need for further consultations in this matter. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. So you will participate in the process, is what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Oh, Certainly. Oh, you're saying. Certainly. That's what the Certainly. COO has said. But it's good. You couldn't have come to the meeting and leave without speaking, right? Eh? It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, Chair. Shirin, load the minutes, please. Thank you, Salga, for attending and showing interest. It's much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. So, These are the minutes of the 22nd of April, 2021, uh, at 19 hours, where we were receiving the briefing on the APPs by the Department of Cooperative Governance and the Municipal Support Agency. In that meeting, we also received the progress report on the CWP remodeling. The colleagues that were present are there, the chairperson, Honorable Direko Pumza, Hadewe, Kawanchawa, and then Honorable Chloe has been on sick leave, and then Honorable Brink, Honorable Spies, and then Apology, Honorable Mabika has been on sick leave, Honorable Mkalipi, Honorable Kleza has been present, and there was an apology. She was not well as well, Honorable Butelezi. And then Honorable Horevald was in our midst. Um, those were the deliberations, issues raised. on both uh, DCOC, MISA, and on the CWP project. The issue is that is all this information been submitted sharing because this information was supposed to have been submitted to us by 29th of April. Has it been submitted? Or the resolution register will talk to that? Uh, yes, Chairperson, it was submitted but it's also in the resolution register. Mm. Okay. Then the meeting agent at 22.330. You meant business then. Oh. 
Can I get a mover and a seconder for this minute's colleagues? I move, JP. Chet, I move. Uh, Honorable please move, seconded by Honorable Mpumsa. Yes, next set of minutes. Next set of minutes, Shirin, the meeting minutes are thus adopted. Shirin, are you bringing the next set of minutes, please? There we go. The minutes of the 22nd of April at nine hours is the meeting with the Department of Traditional Affairs on the progress of the implementation of the 2017 traditional leadership in the resolutions. Then the members that were present are those ones that are listed there. Go down. Ah, are you sure, Shirin? Another bit less, is it the true reflection? It was me and you. And the man. Honorable Director, I'd apologize. Uh, I don't think so. Hey, it was you, me, Teresa, and a man, pretty Karan Chara. I know Mkalipi had apologized. Uh, yes. Yes, peace attended. She got cut. She asked to be released as well. I remember. Mm. Honorable Show apology. Hadewe. Honorable Coronavirus, can you remind us you were in this with the loan traditional leaders? That's the only person I cannot remember. Jefferson, um, I'm not sure um, if I was in that meeting. It doesn't ring a bell. Um, but I know there were two meetings we had with traditional Yeah, we had the one, one in the morning and the one in the evening. Yeah, the one I did miss. Yeah, the morning one, you were not there. There was an apology, yes. I remember. Put the apology there. The evening one, you were there. That applies to Honorable Brink as well. If I could mem remember correctly, Chairperson, I think the evening one is where the howls happened with the video on the background. <laughs> Is it the one? No, it did already happen that one. <laughs> in that I case, Chairperson, Chairperson, in that I case, I wasn't, I was not in that meeting. I only got the messages. So I towards the, I wasn't in that one. Yeah, this one you were in. You remember you were taking your kid before vaccination. You told me. You mean the evening one? The, other the one evening one. The one that yeah, in the evening one, I was yes. not a present. 
During the day you were in, you were in. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, that's the attendance register today. Can I get those who were in the meeting to move for yeah, the adoption? Move. Honorable Liza? I move, Chair. Please. Seconded by who? Seconded by who? Mam Chise, where are you? She was here, Mus. Mam Keys. Mam Keys. Mam Keys. Pumza, second time I'm in it. Where's Mam Keys and Honorable Pumza? Can we defend them and you call them, Sharon, to come back to the meeting? Yes, Chair, I will quickly get hold of them. But mm. Honorable Pumza is connected still to the platform. Same thing with uh, Honorable Kavancha, but they are both here, unless they are somewhere doing some stuff. Because I want one of them to. Let us send it over then. I know there's a mover, I need a second. I'll ask Peace to do that, but she left the meeting. But she was in the meeting. Can you get the next set of the minutes while you, Amanda, try to call the two to connect, to be physically in the meeting? Amanda. To be physically in the meeting. No teacher. Chair. Yes, I'm here. Chair President. Is it Honorable Mbumza? Yes, can you second the minutes of the meeting of the 22nd of April, Honorable Mpumza? Honorable Mpumza? Hello, Chair. Second the minutes of the 22nd of April. I want you to second. You are muted and mute, Honorable Mpumza, so that you can talk. Honorable Mpumza, unmute your microphone. Unmute your microphone. You are on mute. Uh, unmute. Can you unmute him, please? He's muted. Honorable Mpumza. Can you please second the minutes of the 22nd of April? He's not talking. What do I do, colleagues? Honorable Mpumza. Honorable Mpumza. You are muted. We can't hear you. Admin, can, can you unmute Honorable Mpumza? We'll have to move, unfortunately. Ne? Now, no, 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 honorable speech. What's happening now? Please, can you mute your microphone? 
My apologies, Chairperson, sorry. Why is the host muting me now as well? Yeah, I was also. Hmm? Honorable Mpumza. Has he left the system now? He seems to have. Let's move to the minutes. We'll stand them down. We'll stand them down. Honorable Kavanchara, are you in the meeting? Because I see she's locked in here. We are going to move to the next set of minutes. You'll defer those ones naturally. The minutes of the meeting of the 18th of May. Is progress report on the petition of Nelma Pierce extension. Those were the members who were present with the apology, with the apologies. Yes. Okay. Okay, you have got the deadline of yesterday. Did you get the information? Shirin? A chairperson, no, I haven't received the report from the Gauteng Human Settlements Department. So you must immediately after this meeting follow it up. Ne? You need to follow it up. If it means you making me sign off a letter to the MEC, let it be. You hear? Then yes, can I get a mover in a second? Can I have a mover in a second of this minutes? I move, Chairperson. Honorable Speaker, move second. Second, Chair. Seconded by Teresa. Is it the last set, except the one for the 22nd of April? Shirin? Chairperson, I'm just loading the one for the 20th of May. That will be the last one. Okay. Twentieth of May, chair, was it Amatole issues? Yes, Mr. Tayza, it was Amatole. Sorry, I didn't record my, my date. Hello, then this is the minutes of the Amatole district, as you rightfully said, it, uh, Honorable Kleiser and the OR Tambo district. And then, yes, those are the people who were colleagues who were in the meeting. And then, yes. Those are the issues of Amato, like district municipality. Hi, Chair. Yes, Hello, Chair. we can hear you. What's wrong with this? We can hear you, but mute your microphone and raise your hand through the system. We'll recognize you. 
I can hear you now, Honorable Mpumsa. But for the time being, mute your microphone. The person, I'm sorry to interrupt, is not uh, the correct set of minutes. It's not the correct one? Eh? No. It's not the right one. Because we can't even have a single resolution. It doesn't work like that. Where is the correct set of minutes? This should have been your draft minutes. Andile? Or you are bringing them, you are not yet read. No, no, Chair, I, um, the, the minutes were edited and sent back to the Secretariat. Oh. This can be the correct minutes, I agree. Amanda, Shirin, where, where are the minutes? Honorable Mpumza, can you hear me now? Sorry, G. Yes, the correct set of minutes is now displayed. Members present, apologies, resolutions it's on page what? Yes. I'll move to your person. Yes. And then did you get the information by the 24th of May? Yes, Chairperson, I did. So why is it not shared with the members? It must be shared. This is the information for the members. Honorable Khonebad has moved. Any second? Any second? Second, sir. Honorable Honorable Butelis is second. Honorable Mpumza, can you second the minutes of the 22nd, please? Honorable Mpumza? I see you're on the platform. I just want you to second, unmute yourself and I second the minute of the 22nd Honorable Mpums. Honorable Mpumza. Honorable Kavan Chava. No, we'll have to stand this minutes down for this, unfortunately. Why can't, uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, and no. then that will conclude the business of right. Or raise his hand, like what Honorable yes. Butelisi has done. Huh? Or communicate via the group. Yes, let's do that. Can you get? Honorable Mpumza to connect, to communicate via the group, whether for him to second the minutes, please. Secretary, do that and give me feedback. Then you'll give me feedback on that one. We have got a resolution register. And then it's not a matter of putting them here, uh, Shirin. I was the parliamentary program so that we can know what to schedule away. How is it? I'm still going to come to the register. Mara, you must tell with us how is the parliamentary program? So? Okay, person, the parliamentary program for, for this week is meetings and many plenaries every day, even on Friday, the is a sitting. 
then next week we're supposed to be doing Sarah Bartman on, on Tuesday, but Tuesday there is also again uh, a plenary in the morning. There is also sittings on Wednesday, Thursday, as well as Friday, and then the then the the, the session closes, and then we back on the sixteenth of August for the third. Then talk to the issues and the resolution we we'll discuss. We which matters are then outstanding, so that uh, we must be given a go ahead to which ones must we prioritize. We want the committee's input on that one. Chairperson, these of the um, long outstanding issues, we still need to do um, quarterly progress reports by the NPA, the SIU, um, the walks on the, the forensic reports in local government. The last meeting we had on that was on the 2nd of March for 2020. We had also in 2020 initially proposed that we do a disaster management colloquium. Um, the House Chairperson's Office said we have to facilitate this process through them as many of the committees will have to form part of this meeting. So um, they'll have to give the committees time off to, to then form part of that meeting. We also said we'll have follow up on amalgamated municipalities as there were still issues outstanding with regards to the funding model for these municipalities about um, the organ, um, the staffing matters, et cetera. We also did say we look at local economic development at municipalities. Um, we'll have to have a discussion with the Department of Traditional Affairs. What happened to the screen, what happened to the screen? I can't see what you're talking to. Can you see now, Kate? Yes. We said we'll have to discuss um, with TTA and the traditional leadership on the implementation of the customary initiation. We and the president what is... And the president is during the opening of the house, uh, tasked us as a committee to host an, an initiation in the. Where did you lose it? I I will include that quickly. Included then um, the meeting with respect to the impact of the disaster management regulations with the religious sector. Um, we wanted to have that meeting on the 4th of June, but now the, the National Assembly is sitting on that day, and it's the, the National Assembly is considering the appropriation bill on that day. So we'll have to look for another date to, to have that interaction. And then on legislation, we have just started the process with the disaster management. Um, we also said we look at um, discussions on the proposed amendments from MDB on the Municipal Demarcation Act. And then we will await the intergovernmental monitor monitoring support any interventions bill. And then the, the, there's quite a few petitions that's been referred to the committee. There's, there's six petitions that, to, that we'll have to look at. And the petition has got timelines. 
when did you receive this? Because then the house will be asking us, why didn't you put the dates, all of them, as to when did you receive them? These petitions was referred to us in, in the... Um, in the order paper of 14th of May. But some of them, oh, no, I, I, again, it was yeah, referred to uh, on the 14th of May. And then um, The last column, these all the resolutions from the first term. I have tried to, the reports that was received, I'm still busy trying to um, upload the others. I uploaded on the Google Drive so that we don't send, I don't send lots of emails to members so they can click on the link provided and then all the documents like this one, all the documents will be will be the that is all the, the the documents from that petition that we dealt with. It. I did update the report. I will send updated the reports as I upload the documents. But the members can just click on those links and the documents for for those. Resolutions will be there. Thank you, Chief. Okay. So how many days are we having that we can utilize prior to the recess and the others will go to the next term? You say you are coming back on the 16th of August, but I see hands. Honorable Kaiser, Honorable Hornewald, in that order. Honorable Kaiser? No, Chair, I just wanted to check uh, in terms of uh, the outstanding matters, whether she, the, the, the secretary spoke about the forensic reports. Uh, I just wanted to check if they also include the five forensic reports that you are still waiting for, for the, from the CWP. Shirin, did you get everything from the minister? Did you get those forensic reports that were asked for, five of them? Jay, I did receive the forensic reports. You did I receive them? Shirin, what is the response? Shirin? I'm on. Okay, I will quickly share the, the, the reports. I'll just, just quickly share some of the reports that, that was received. This is one of the reports that I've received from the department. Share them with the members, please. Yes, Jay, I'll share it. They're not, they're not solely for your records. They must be shared with members for them to read them and express opinions if there's a need for follow-up meetings, we do that. Ne? We do that. Yes, Chairperson. So, can I see the end of Honorable Hunevat? We are going to also schedule the, the this bill now. You're going to issue it, the one that we're dealing with earlier. 
because we need to deliberate and vote on the desirability. But at the same time, we've agreed that we will have to call, maybe when we come back that week of the 16th of August, because this time you're gonna uh, embark on a public consultation process. So that will also be enabling parties to also consult amongst themselves on the matter. So then develop an action plan on how we're going to deal with these matters. Another proposal, Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, um, I think we all as, as, as members of this committee can agree that we do work quite hard um, in terms of all the meetings that we have and all the municipalities that we see, but we can only do effective oversight if we receive the reports. And I know there's a lot of municipalities, for example, that did not submit reports. If we could quickly look at the report that Shireen um, had on just before the last one, um, we can see that there's still a lot of reports outstanding. Can we then maybe ask that we have a meeting in terms of a committee and that legal opinion that you received, Honorable Chairperson, in regards to our powers and privileges, mm. that we have a meeting in terms of that and mm. see how many reports is outstanding? Because in terms of that legal opinion, we as a committee must decide if we want to act or not. Um, to have a meeting and discuss that, um, I think that's quite important, Chairperson. And so we are told we have been given to committees that are terrorists and of a responsibility. The moment the day arrives, you must send a reminder that the members are, are taken on, on breast because it's only a very simple thing of the of the oversight visit. There are municipalities that they didn't submit. And I don't think members know that, but we agreed on clear timelines. I don't recall being given a letter to sign. You can do that on your own to just say it's a reminder. Then when there's no response, this must preoccupy our meetings when we start our meeting first. Because like you are saying, honorable Hunavad, it's a futile exercise. And then I think, can we do that consolidation? You do the follow-ups this week so that we do what honorable Hunavad, those that don't want to comply. Because I know we still have the outstanding matter. Is it what? Where in those reports, we need to meet as honorable Hunavad is saying and decide on the course of action. And we deliberately ask those people to submit those things in writing because they've been practically lying to us, not telling us the truth in the meetings. So can you isolate that together with the researcher and the two of you so that you say, I mean, if you can give a person an allowance of a two days to default, but if it's the day that is agreed upon and then they don't comply, so that we start to send this message because the mere fact that we don't follow up on issues, nobody is going to take us serious. Can we agree that will strengthen our admin side on that side? This is purely administrative on the member side. And as administration, you've got the duty to remind members. If we say reports by this date and the reports are not there by this date, can you write an email to the members to say, in our meeting on this date, there's a report, that's the report that you are going to use as members to then uh, uh, enforce the, 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 the provision of the powers and privilege. But we can't do that without that support. Can I agree with you colleagues? I'm going to meet with the team, isolate issues. And then as in when we meet, when is our next meeting? We'll then be able to tell you which, which are the issues that we need to do. They are going to rework on the program so that we deal with those matters. Unfortunately, this time, we're not going to request for, for working because I'm told this is a recess for elections. We must be, all of us go and work, like to work in the evenings from the 16th. But let's do everything now so that we are covered. Any other end? 
nothing. So when we meet, we are going to isolate these issues as Honorable Honorable said, to say these are the matters that we can call the legal services to advise us on the cost of, but this legal opinion is very clear. It will be the actual process. How do you go about? And they will have looked at that as well by the time we're convinced. Is it okay, colleagues? Yes, sir. Because it's the right time. We can't be wasting our time here. People come and lie to us, and then we give them. They must come and explain to us why have they not uh, given us the documents as requested. In fact, we don't even have to beg them now. If there's a deadline, isolate the name of the document. It was supposed to be submitted by this date, not submitted, so that we were able to call these people and then do what Honorable Ekronevalde said. We need to, it's high time we need to do that. People mustn't undermine this, the, 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 the decorum of their house because otherwise they will know that they just get called in parliament, they come and talk whatever they want to say, and then there's no follow up, they're fine. And then it become a futile exercise that we spend and only hours here dealing with these matters and there's, there's no feedback. Then we're not taken seriously. And the side time, we need to invoke the, the, the provisions of the Powers and Privilege Act. We need to do that. But we need that through the support of the Secretariat. Can we adjourn this meeting, colleagues? Till we meet again. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Mpumza has confirmed that he's uh, seconding the minutes of the 22nd of April as proposed by Honorable Kess. That completes the record. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. I'm back thank now. Thank you, Chair. At the latter part of the meeting, you are back now. Hey, honorable the catch it. Yeah, the catch it. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.